Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Buck Stops Here. I'm Catherine Murray. Well, as we look at uh, the markets, it's certainly been a very interesting year, a very volatile year, a lot of unknowns. And we're heading into the year end. And just to put everything into perspective right now, we've got uh, the Dow down by about 6% on a year-to-date basis, um, but up by 19% on a quarterly basis. The TSX down by about uh, 5% as well on a year-to-date A lot of damage, though, has been done underneath the surface of stocks that you may own. And uh, and also, even though we've recouped a lot of the losses, again, we are still down quite significantly, particularly in the tech sector, the Nasdaq down by about 27 percent, again, on a year to date basis. So let's get some perspective in terms of where we stand and where we think we're going, not only into year end, but of course, into 2023. And for that, Martin Pelletier is joining us. He's a senior portfolio manager at Wellington Altus Private Council. Martin, um, great to have you with us and to provide perspective to our viewers um, with all of your background on the institutional as well as the retail side of, uh, of Bay Street. So thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, Martin, I do want to start off with your kind of big picture view. We did hear from the FOMC this week with respect to their minutes, and it does appear uh, that the majority believe that they should slow the pace of tightening, but that the terminal rate might be higher than previ- previously expected. I mean, the market took this as dovish, but this is key and critical in terms of where we want to invest going forward as it relates to the rates putting pressure on valuations and what areas of the market make the most sense. So what's your takeaway from what we heard and what do you think they might really mean? So <clears throat> it comes down to inflation and expectations and how central banks, in particular the Federal Reserve, is going to respond. Uh, Inflation is still quite high. Real rates are still negative. So we need to get to a positive territory. And so markets are going to, and market participants are continuing to try and figure out where inflation is going, especially on things like core CPI, which the Fed is keeping a very close eye on, and, and then how the Fed is going to respond. We're used to living in a low rate QE environment and participants are thinking, uh, a lot of them in many cases, are thinking we're going back to that scenario. And so when are we going to go back to that scenario? And that's where the bets are being placed. And and what do you think? Because, um, you know, there are many people who are indicating that we are absolutely seeing a slowdown in the economy, whether it's in the United States and or Canada, we're quite closely linked, obviously. Uh, And therefore, you know, the Fed or the BOC will, in fact, you know, really start to pull back. So in other words, we might actually be going back to that lower rate environment. But then there are others who will say, look, no, the economy is not that bad um, and that we do need to combat inflation. And and again, I talk a lot about interest rates with various guests, but it's so key and critical in terms of uh, where we go next and if there's going to be too much damage done and has the Fed or the BOC gone too far and will they cause a deeper recession? So what what do you think will will we ultimately see, let's say six months out from now? Well, I don't think we're going to be in a, as in the depths of a recession or uh, what many of the, the bear pundits are saying. And I mean, you can see that just by boots in the ground and by witnessing, just go try and book a hotel this Christmas and you know, spend $500 a night for a standard standard room at the Days Inn. Nothing against the Days Inn, but $500 a night is a little bit pushing it. So, you know, there's, there's the services inflation that just isn't coming down. People are not canceling their holidays. Um, spending is still, um, even though savings are, are down and visa bills are up, um, you, you're, you're just not seeing the type of activity that you would witness during a, a typical recession. And so as long as this type of activity happens, I mean, look at Canada, uh, retail sales were up one and a half percent in, in October. And, uh, and so you're still seeing that uh, frontline behavior um, of, of spending by consumers. And, and that has to stop or slow down anyway, uh, before central banks start to, uh, to consider slowing the pace of their hikes, which they already have a little bit. But when it comes to cutting it all together, uh, we're still a ways away from that. So do you liken, it seems as though you liken the current scenario to the time period of of 2000 um, when we were seeing uh, Greenspan raise rates or the impact of that and uh, and, and some negative pressure on stocks. Yeah. And so we're looking at duration exposure 
And duration exposure was very similar back to 2000 with technology companies and the sensitivity to interest rates. Maybe not to the same extent, but we're seeing that uh, continue to play out in, in today's market environment. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. It seems as though we might be in an environment where rates are going to be higher than what we've been used to. They won't be skyrocketing, but it does change the landscape or or the way you want to look at investing. That's kind of what I'm taking away from uh, from our conversation. With with that said, if that's accurate, um, let's talk about, because you've got a lot of great ideas here. Um, Where do you want to be invested right now? What, What worked in the early 2000s that you think will work again? Well, companies that can make money in a higher rate environment is a good place to start. So the easy trade, the free money trade is finished in in my opinion. And so um, maybe it's not finished, but maybe it's turned into a sports bet or online gambling because you're going to get tremendous volatility there as people trying to speculate that we're going back to below 2%. Um, That's just not an area that, that we're interested in. But when you're looking at where we were back in the early 2000s, it was start of the, of another commodity run. And uh, I think it's quite similar. I think we're two years into a seven to eight year run in commodities. Maybe not to the same extent to to the upside as uh, in regards to attracting capital and driving these these share prices higher from that extent, um, because there just isn't a lot of interested uh, amount of of capital pension plans and such that are are looking at investing in energy. And uh, and so as a result, um, you know, there may not be that kind of huge torque, but on the other side of things, uh, we have a sector that's been severely underinvested in, not just energy, but materials and other sectors. And so on the supply side, um, you know, that's looking very, very strong uh, fundamentally. And so uh, that's an area that, that, that that's getting a lot of interest uh, from us. And how do you how do you then play the commodity sector? I mean, are you buying an ETF? Are you buying specific companies? What's the best way? So for the average investor, uh, the best way would be to go overweight Canadian uh, stocks and, and the TSX, simply by the composure of the index, with energy and materials being a, a larger component. Uh, we think that will outperform. We've seen that outperformance this year with the TSX outperforming uh, the S&P. Actually, I was uh, talking with a reporter the other day about uh, stripping out Shopify from the uh, TSX and, and we're actually getting close to flat this year. So energy hmm. has been very rewarding for uh, for those with an overweight to Canadian stocks. And so that's a great place to start. Hmm. Okay. Um, and what about other areas? I, I, I think that you're also interested in high dividend payers. Yeah. And so the, the way we're, we're playing this kind of environment, we do think it has a lot of potential to play out very similar to what happened post-World War II when you had a major interruption in the economy. Uh, you had COVID this time around with a, with a global shutdown. And so there's a lot of parallels to the 40s to, to where we are now. And if that does play out, um, then you have a situation where you have a flat to range bound market. And so um, you want to have some, some nice dividend or some nice income and what I mean by that is companies are going to be able to grow their dividends in this kind of economic environment. And, uh, and, and, and so, you know, we like utilities, we like energy, uh, even some of the banks. And, uh, and so you're getting paid a nice yield. Um, and then if you have a, a way to get a call option, so if, you're, if we're wrong on the flat market and markets do recover, then you're going to get some capital appreciation. It's a little bit of a blend of both dividend plus a call option on, on future growth. What's the risk, though, that um, in this environment um, to find a company that will continue consistently to grow their dividend might become rare? Uh, Some CEOs will decide to be a little bit more prudent um, or use the environment as a reason to not grow their dividend. Yeah, so certain sectors, yes. Yes, certain sectors, yes. Certain sectors, no. And, uh, and so, like, for example, going back to the energy, and I don't want to belabor the point, but there's tremendous cash flow being generated in that sector. And governments and, and institutions are saying, do not put that back into the ground. We do not want more conventional uh, oil production or natural gas production. So, you know, there's increased dividends or do buybacks or pay back debt. 
So that's one sector that uh, that that that's not going to play out for. And there are other sectors that are going to be facing challenges. But again, we there's a lot of fear and uncertainty about what lies ahead. And so instead of putting money back into capital spending, um, maybe there's other companies just find ways to boost uh, to boost their dividends instead of uh, of investing for growth. Hmm. Um, and and from an ETF perspective, though, a high yield ETF that might be worthwhile looking at is XCI. Yeah, we like that one because you're you're getting exposure to those segments of the market that I just described. You got energy, financials, utilities, materials, and consumer, and uh, all of those segments are are fairly protected within Canada and are growing their dividends. Okay. You know, Martin, one of the things I think that's been difficult for a lot of people this year is just kind of looking at their overall portfolio and depending on how it has been constructed. Um, looking at perhaps some significant losses if they were 60-40 uh, equities and, and fixed income because we've seen pressure in both areas of the market with rates rising significantly. We've seen a lot of downward pressure on the value of their fixed income uh, portfolio. Um, so how do you think investors should be looking at fixed income today? Well, it looks a lot more attractive than it was nine months ago. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I there, you know, we we follow it very closely in regards to uh, duration exposure, not just on the fixed income, but comparing it to uh, the duration exposure on the equity side. If you ask your your advisor or portfolio manager what the duration exposure on your equity uh, um, portfolio uh, allocation is, they'll just very likely give you a blank look and and so i, I definitely challenge you to, to do that um but it, what it does is it tells you what who's more bearish or bullish in regards to the forward outlook and what central banks are doing and so there are dislocations and so you can do a 20-year treasury versus um the nasdaq for example and there are gaps there and so there was a period of time the last couple of weeks where uh the investors in 20 year treasuries were a lot more bearish than what the NASDAQ was. And so um, if you are looking at making a duration bet, um, you can look at what's being factored into the valuations on fixed income versus equities, if that makes sense. I think you're gonna have to explain that a little bit more. People don't think of it like that. Yeah. And so what I mean by that is we want to look at interest rate sensitivity um, on, on the positions that you own. And so what we mean by that is, uh, it, it, the longer the 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 exposure to uh, the term, the, so if you're 20 or 30 year uh, bonds, uh, the greater sensitivity you're going to have to interest rates. And companies that depend on capital and a low cost of capital that don't have a lot of upfront earnings that were projected to have growth, but earnings down the road are, are very similar in regards to their exposure to interest rates. And so they will move up and down with interest rates as well too. So what I mean by that is, um, is uh, the those types of stocks will say, hey, we think interest rates are gonna fall in 2023 and, and come back down again. And so as a result, we're gonna own this and our multiples are gonna go up. Um, and if the treasuries, the yields haven't moved, they're saying, now nah, we're not thinking that it's gonna happen in 2023, maybe 2024. And so if you're going to looking at buying into that kind of a trade and you think that rates are going to fall in 2023, you're better to do so through the bond market. And so that's where a good portfolio manager will come in and just look at these sorts of things and help determine the proper allocation and where there's better uh, value opportunities. So, and again, it does go back to what we've been seeing, quite a bit of dislocation in the market. And at the end of the day, Again, you really, I, I think that you have to be able to get the interest rate environment right. And that has been very, very difficult. I mean, I, I think there's, I know a lot of um, incredibly successful hedge fund managers that, you know, decided they didn't want to fight the Fed over the past decade or so because you couldn't really go short um, because they were just pumping up the market. So with all the liquidity, it, so, so we have all these different dynamics that make 
um, money management difficult, but I guess at the end of the day, look at the dislocations and try to figure out again where we might be going. Uh, not easy to do. You can, you can see it in a lot of people's results. Having said all of that, though, um, what is the view right now then in terms of going long some corporate bonds, as an example? Yeah, and so I call that the chicken little, or the not the chicken little, sorry, the a chicken way of playing the the equities. So there's a lot of fear out there right now. And, uh, and, and and investors, from what we're hearing, are looking and saying, well, I'll just buy GICs that pay 5%. But if inflation does stick around, that's still a negative real return. And it will impact your, your goals. And so if you want to look at going into the market, corporate bonds are really interesting. Um, in Canada, for example, you could buy a basket of these, of these corporate bonds paying a 5.5% coupon. Uh, yield, and 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 you get the optionality so that if rates do fall back down again, um, there's probably about ten to twelve percent upside in capital appreciation. So now you're talking about mid single digits. You get paid while you were waiting for the eventual recovery, and so that's a, a safer trade in our opinion than simply just buying a buying a, a, a basic index. Would you use a, an ETF for this? Yeah, so one of the ones there there are, are some good ETFs by BMO or iShares. XCB is is okay. one, for example, okay. that we've used. Um, so for okay. the average investor, there's there's some good ETFs out there. Martin, uh, when I got your notes in terms of areas of uh, interest and focus for you for your clients. Um, I was a bit surprised when I saw structured notes. Uh, so bring me up to date in terms of what's going on within that area of the market and why you like it now. So for about eight, nine years, we, we were active traders in derivatives and options as an option overlay on top of our client portfolios. A tax reporting we found was a real nightmare <laughs> and the tracking mm. um, unless you ran it within a fund. And, uh, and then there also was periods of low volatility um, where uh, those options were not very attractive. Um, we're entering into a period right now where we have much higher interest rates and a lot of volatility in the markets. And that makes option trading very attractive. Now, for the average investor or even the average advisor, they may not even be allowed to trade options. And, and again, I just mentioned the reporting is also very challenging. So there's something called a structured note, which is a contractual obligation. It's a bond. It's a, basically a, a bond that's issued by a capital markets group, such as uh, BMO does good work, CIBC, National Bank, and, and others. And so they'll issue a bond uh, with a contractual obligation. So there's counterparty risk, but your counterparty is the bank and, the, and a Canadian bank, and uh, and and they'll do an option, um, a, a series of, of option contracts within that bond with an outcome. Uh, based on a particular index. And so these are very interesting right now because again, you're able to harvest that, that volatility so you can get some really good yields um, and get some market upside with some market downside all embedded within, within a note. Can you give an example of that? Yeah, so uh, for example, uh, we just did one on the Canadian banks. And what it will do is, um, is right now, banks are down 15% on average, 10 to 15%. It's on a basket of Canadian banks. Uh, it, it, at the end of one year, if the Canadian banks are 0% or higher, this basket, so if they're up 1%, uh, the bond closes out. We get a 10% coupon payment and we get the tracking to the upside. So that's not a lot. You only would only get the 1%. But if you own the stock itself, then you, only, you would have only got the 1%. If it's up 20% in a year, the bond closes out, you get a 10% coupon and you get a 20% uh, additional incremental to track the market to the upside. And um, it goes out for about five years with 30% downside. And, uh, and so at the end of the five years, if it's flat to minus five, you get all your money back and you wouldn't have lost anything. So, you know, that's just a safer way of playing the Canadian banks, but with a really nice outcome hmm. potentially. Hmm. And, and what kind of terms are there? Are they one year, three year, five year? What are you seeing mostly in the market? Well, the, the nice thing is, is that you can build these things on any term. Uh, you can do, uh, we've done ones as short as two and a half. We've done one as long as seven. 
Uh, you can do ones with high coupon payments. Uh, you can do one with lower coupon payments. You can do one with 100% downside protection. You could do ones with 30, 40% downside protection, and you can do it on any index that you like. And so, for example, if we do a lot of thorough research on a segment or a, a sector that we do like, but we don't think there's a lot of upside and we think it's probably flat, um, then we can still make money off of that. So, for example, we did a note on uh, capped utilities. So Fortis, Brookfield, Demira, Hydro One, and it's going to pay us a 10.5% coupon every month as long as those stocks don't fall more than 25%. They fall more than 25% in a month, you uh, miss your coupon payment. Um, for utility sector, we think that's very unlikely. Um, and so instead of buying a, a, the stocks themselves and getting a 5% dividend, uh, getting a 10.5% uh, coupon is taxed as income, but still 10.5% is 10.5%. Hmm. And just to be clear for viewers to understand, when you say we do a note, you are researching the certain areas within the market, you go to the bank and they structure this for you. And, it, and it, it's an agreed upon uh, terms between you, your team, your company and the banks. Is that correct? Yeah. And so um, so some advisors, I mean, the, the what will often happen is uh, they'll take the best ideas. So if we come up with a, a really good uh, note, they'll package up the note and put it on the shelf. So we'll get first dibs on it. We'll buy it. And then they'll put it on the shelf for other uh, portfolio managers to buy. So you can actually go on the shelf and, and pick these things, or you can custom build them if you mm. can go in with size. And so they're really a good tool for, for investment advisors and portfolio managers. Okay. Martin, we're going to leave it there. It's great to, um, to see you and be with you and get your thoughts and advice and really some strategic uh, ways to, to invest. There's always a good way to make money. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Have a wonderful day. Thanks. And thanks, everybody, for watching. We'll see you next time.